You know, I'm 1,500 years old. I've killed twice as many enemies as that, and every one of them would have rather killed me, but none succeeded. I'm only alive because fate wants me alive. And what if you're wrong? Well, if I'm wrong, then what more could I lose? Inheriting memory is something we all go through. It can come from something as simple as listening to a parent telling you an anecdote to the cultural practices and traditions that we all grow up with. And this simple experience is ultimately what Thor's seven film journey is actually all about. Despite how incredibly inconsistent and creatively bizarre he is, he's a character centered on the process of modeling the self to different narratives. From a sense of nostalgia towards an inherited history to the trauma of losing everything. And the question I want to ask is, what does Thor tell us about memory and the creation of identity? So strap in kids, this is going to be a long one. <laughs> Horses, just dogs, cats, birds. And hey, give me one of those large enough to ride. You are no match for the mighty! Early on in Thor 1, we're given a history lesson contextualizing the grandiosity of the story. Some worlds, man believed to be home to their gods. For Thor, he identifies with the historical image of war, feudal conflict, and simple heroism. He's modeled himself with this nostalgia, as defined in the mnemonic imagination. Yes, I'm referencing this book again. Nostalgia is a form of temporal dislocation, a closed feeling that comes from being connected to a different place in time. And this often thrives under times of change. What action would you take? March into Jotunheim as you once did. Teach them a lesson. Break their spirits or will never dare try to cross our borders again. You're thinking only as a warrior. This was an act of war! It was the act of but a few. Thor is a warrior, nostalgic for war during times of peace, so he doesn't really idolize his father, but the idea of his father. Thor projects more of his own personal narcissism onto him than what he actually represents. And that is why they clash, and why Thor ends up being punished. You'd stand giving speeches while Asgard falls. You are a vain, greedy! Cool boy! And you are an old man and a fool! But this isn't the actual opening to the film. The story establishes itself actually first with Jane encountering Thor. So at the center of the story, this is all about dislocation. Thor isn't just temporally dislocated, he's also physically dislocated. Jane is the first person we clearly see, therefore she directly contrasts Odin's presence. She's symbolic of the present rather than the past, something alien to Thor but it's something we can look into the eyes of and identify with. Therefore, Thor is placed into a crossroad between two worlds, the grandiose world of illusory but impenetrable nostalgia and the real world of love and vulnerabilities. <gasps> I'm sorry. Identification with the present or with the past. As Joseph Campbell described, this is called crossing of the, f the crossing of the first threshold. My bloody lisp is really not helping. Where the hero has to step into the unknown without knowing if he could ever return. The big moment representative of this is when Thor not only fails to pick up the hammer, but when he supposedly hears that his father had died. 
That nostalgic identification is torn off its connection with reality. Nothing corresponds to the way he knows anymore. I'm so sorry. Oh. I am sorry. No one was ever going to find his way in this world. Let's just start by admitting he doesn't know where the hell he is. It's with the people of Earth that Thor develops a level of resilience with his trauma because he finds new relevance with these people that is very much distinctively different to his identity from Asgard. He originally had the cultural and mnemonic identity of a warrior and a prince, but without his hammer and with someone like Jane, instead he's a teacher and a lover. Can we go outside? Yes, of course. He sees his own life and his own history through a different set of eyes. This is all wonderfully encapsulated in an intimate exchange where he's giving her some answers. Tell me more. So the nine realms. Now there is Midgard, which is Earth. It's Alfheim, Vanaheim. Like his father, Thor is simply telling a story, but also like a child, he's excited to talk about himself. By sharing, Thor gained access to a new frontier in his sense of identity, because he's not looking at the present through the disappointing lens of the past, but looking at the past through the enthusiasm of the present. So in the end, after beating Loki and destroying the Bifrost, he's humbled by this new connection and looks off into an open landscape of possibilities. Knowing she's waiting for him, the first Thor film looks at memory and puts a highlighter to the concept of transition in the form of Odin and with Jane. Thor learns to admire the man his father has become rather than long for who he was, and he falls in love with a woman who is unrelated to his own sense of personal heritage, thus becoming a new man. Everything about the first Thor movie is really, really sincerely simple, and this includes its lesson. We should all learn from the past, but even more importantly, learn to fall in love with the present. Which sounds way more cornier than I expected, saying it out loud, but the Manola is this ideal made material. And that is why Thor is worthy. <laughs> I'm gonna lop Avengers 1, Dark World and Age of Ultron to one section because I think they fit quite well together to tell a story of Thor holding onto his new self-concept. As Joseph Campbell would note, this is the character's roads of trials. Once having traversed a threshold, the hero moves in a dream landscape of curiously fluid ambiguous forms where he must service a succession of trials. In the Avengers, Thor isn't really a character, he's more of a plot device. Someone for the Avengers to hand Loki to and to contextualize the wider significance of the story. There are a couple of scenes that do humanize him quite effectively. There's his moment with Coulson where he's contemplating his own identification with war and destruction and he's very clearly critical of it. In my youth I called it war. His other moment is his reaction to Coulson's death, which is used to put him in a similar emotionally relevant level with the other Avengers. And there's scenes of him pleading with Loki for Earth. He loves his new home as much as he loves his brother, so Thor has a slight arc as someone who perseveres holding on to his love for a new place. And you could say this is his first trial, a test of his connection with the present. Thor's next big trial happens in Dark World, which is a deeply flawed movie and I think a lot of it can be credited to its incredibly troubled development, along with some pretty poo-poo performances. As excuses go, it's not terrible. But it also does an interesting job paying off some of the ideas from Thor 1. The story opens with Thor pretty much getting everything he ever wanted before. Is that why everything's on fire? to play a hero in times of war and to finally get a chance to wear the crown. He's actually become the ideal image of his father without even knowing it. Thor is now wise and humble. Stay here, be with your people where your heart is. You have my thanks. But the movie deconstructs this connection by turning Odin into a ruthless old codger. <laughs> Odin isn't representative of Thor's previous nostalgic vision, but is representative of moral decline. He's a ruthless cold general now, that's not too different with Malekith. How are you different from Malekith? The difference, my son, is that I will win. Which is weird and totally not the character that we were presented to last time, but I guess, well, we'll have to chalk it up to grief. And maybe grouchiness from having to abruptly wake up to save his annoying kids. You're my son. 
I wanted only to protect you from the truth. Your birthright was to die! The death of Frigga, which breaks Odin and Loki, doesn't break Thor though. Instead, he stands up for his moral convictions and even takes the opportunity to be with his brother. She wouldn't want us to fight. Well, she wouldn't exactly be shocked. What Thor previously nostalgically identified with becomes the source of his present disillusionment, so he turns down the crown to be with Jane in the end. I'd rather be a good man than a great king. With his new eyes, he can't see his old desires with the same level of relevance. There's no negative judgement of the present, but instead, a positive embrace. This was a test of Thor's connection with the past, a test by temptation. Moving into Age of Ultron, Thor is tested with his connection with the future. Wanda gives him visions of Ragnarok, and upon further investigation, he has visions of the Infinity Gauntlet. Which on one hand is Joss Whedon clearly writing Thor out of the story, because what do you do with a fantasy character? In a story largely centred on sci-fi themes, but there's actually some great thematic weight in the sense that Thor's temporal horizon now stretches into the future. His trial is a test on how he responds to fear. You helped create this? I've had a vision. A whirlpool that sucks in all hope of life and at its centre is that. Vision represents a lot of things for a lot of different characters, and it's something I totally want to get into in a separate video at one point, but for Thor, Vision is the apogee of Thor's new perspective on life. So there may be no way to make you trust me, but we need to go. If Ultron represented a violent, fearful perspective of the future, then Vision is, to a large extent, Thor's optimistic trust in people's ability to change for the future because he himself changed. And despite Ultron's big speeches about how much better he is than humanity, he's no better in making the same mistakes. He's more or less projecting his own failures to the character of something else, which is something that Thor is all too familiar with. So Thor ends up being a counterbalance to this perspective, because where Tony is a pessimistic futurist and Steve has become disenchanted with modern times, there's not an ounce of cynicism in Thor's perspective. In fact, this could be understood as to why Vision is called Vision. Like how Jane gave Thor a new set of eyes to see the world, where Vision is Thor's new set of eyes for humanity. But a thing isn't beautiful because it lasts. It's a privilege to be among them. Vision is like Mignola in a way. He's a temporal character made flesh, or mechanical in this case. So upon retrospect, seeing Thor leave to search for answers about what's going on kind of works as a small little ending for his character. At least for his current junction in life. Whatever the unknown is, he'll confront it with bravery and a very robust pair of hopeful eyes. <laughs> That's impressive. Quality saves. Consequently, this period of Thor puts a spotlight to the connection between identity and time. How we understand the future, the present, and the past comes from the values of what we hold to ourselves. And Thor is able to tightly hold a grip on his life by a sense of romance. Not necessarily with Jane, but with everything. It's kind of difficult to talk about the post-Ragnarok Thor without acknowledging how radically, tonally, and aesthetically different the character becomes, because for a good number of years within the original MCU trinity of characters, Thor tended to be disregarded as the other guy, the one that's least interesting. So to make him commercially bankable, they took a page out of the Guardians of the Galaxy book and pushed him into the realms of the creatively absurd and affectionately jovial. That's what However, what makes this brand reinvention work and not just commercially cynical is how Ragnarok has a sense of artistic purpose that is actually radically more confident and cohesive than Dark World. Taika Waititi's goofy humour is more or less a tool used to deconstruct Thor's character by bringing attention to the storytelling process itself. Similar to Thor 1 and Dark World, we open with a narration, setting the stage for the coming events, but where previously they were used entirely to establish a level of dramatic gravitas to the story. From a realm of cold and darkness, the Malekith sought to transform our universe in the Frost Giants. Evil was possible through the power of the Aether. In the end, their king fell. The source of their power was taken from them. 
Ragnarok ditches this goal for a more jovial but more intimate perspective. We open with Thor telling a story to a skeleton, but it's very clearly addressed to us, the audience. It's a long story, but basically I'm a bit of a hero. See, I spent some time on Earth. Fought some robots, saved the planet a couple of times. The mood of address itself becomes the subject in this case. There's a bunch of other signals too that is present to make the audience aware of this in the beginning, like Loki's play that recounts the events of the previous film. I didn't do it for him. I didn't do it for him. I didn't do it for him. Thor referring to his own role as the hero. That's what heroes do and there's Doctor Strange who uses jump cuts as a form of magic. In other words, Thor Ragnarok is a story about storytelling on an introspective level. My sons. Historical level. Proud to have it. Shamed of how we got it. <laughs> Interpersonal level. Okay, I thought the world of you. I thought we were gonna fight side by side forever, but at the end of the day, you're you and I'm me. Cultural level. Collective level. Take to the streets. Celebrate my champion. Hierarchical level. Where once you were nothing, now you are something. In terms of language. Made it in the slaves of Am themselves. I, I don't like that word. Yes word, yes word. Sorry, the prisoners with jobs have armed themselves. And in terms of its own relationship with the audience, the antagonist Hela is used as a scalpel to unveil how truly artificial all of this really is. Because storytelling and meaning making in general requires a level of selectivity as evaluations can only be made if you can look at everything abstractly. There's a great quote from a book called Foon's El Memoriso, which is to think is to forget a difference, to generalize, to abstract. If people can't be selective with details, then it becomes impossible for anyone to learn anything. It's a difference between reading a biography and reading a Wikipedia timeline of someone's life, or being told to remember 11 numbers compared to remembering someone's phone number. And in Thor Ragnarok, the Ragnarok process itself isn't just about referring to the end of the world, but an ending to narratives in general. What happens when you're forced to pull back and everything becomes incomprehensible and chaotic? What happens when the events are so catastrophic that it overwhelms whatever is being framed and from what our eyes allow us to see? But what makes it different from being a Lars von Trier film is that what's emotionally pronounced isn't futility, but are the small wonders that happen in spite of this. Like Loki and Thor's new connection, the survival and perseverance of the Asgardian people despite the loss of Asgard, Executioner's redemption, Bruce giving up to Hulk, Sakaar's revolution, Valkyrie's recovery, these little arcs is what keeps the story afloat tonally. This this is a story about the survival of identity even in the face of collective mnemonic erosion. And this is done by deliberately including the awkward dysfunctional realities of people within the framing of the story. Not done to indict anyone, but to celebrate them instead. Asgard is not a place. Never was. This could be Asgard. Asgard is where our people stand. Even now, right now, those people need your help. The story could have made Odin the villain for hiding Asgard's imperialist history, but it doesn't, because his new world made of peace and worship of heroism is what made his children better. They don't see the world through the lens of warmongering, but with the eyes of altruism and love. Which does add a bit more weight to why Odin was so quick and willing to exile Thor to Earth in the first film. He was afraid that history would repeat itself. And also why Odin wasn't mad at Loki for also exiling himself to Earth. Because Loki not only didn't wage any wars or anything as the King of Asgard, but Odin was an asshole in Dark World. <laughs> So kicking him away meant that his adopted son was more like him than the biological son. I'm Thor, son of Odin. You don't look like him. Perhaps we can come to an arrangement. You sound like him. Despite the deception, Odin's legacy is one of success. So the conclusion that the story makes is that history and storytelling isn't an autonomous process. We may be subjects to them, but it takes people to make meaning from them. And I think the scene that encapsulates the fundamental spirit of the signature is with the ending. Thor finally sits down as the King of Asgard, the music swells up with the recognisable Patrick Doyle theme, and then it suddenly cuts out when he realises that there's no plan. I'm not sure. Any suggestions? Earth it is.
Earth was where Thor gained his new pair of eyes, so even when the old narratives are wiped clean, there's nothing wrong with starting a new story with a new set of perspectives. So Thor Ragnarok still functions adequately as a direct sequel to Thor Dark World, despite how tonally jarring it is because it ultimately maintains the same theme of memory and identity and it also starts a new story. By getting rid of Asgard, instead of deconstructing Thor's connection to a place, now we can finally deconstruct him as a person. Infinity War and Endgame kind of works as one unit of story for Thor because it captures one journey. The events leading up to and the aftermath of one traumatic act. Infinity War is the last echoes of the Thor we know. He's written to be a synthesis of the familiar, dramatically grounded Thor from pre-Ragnarok and the more jovial performance of the Taika Waititi version. The moment that reconciles the contrasting iterations of the character is with the confession scene with Rocket. Thanos is just the latest in a long line of bastards and he'll be the latest to feel my vengeance fate. Wills it so. Thor is resilient towards the initial impact of losing half his people, Heimdall and Loki, because he's able to assemble a new story in his mind that appropriates the experience into his sense of continuity. Lost regret, they're all tremendous motivators. They really clear the mind, so I'm, I'm good to go. So they've effectively taken the theme of framing and discourse from Ragnarok and internalized it within Thor's psychology while taking itself far more seriously. Thor built himself a new concept in Thor 1, held on to it in The Avengers, and then he completely committed to it in Dark World, and then he celebrated it in Age of Ultron, then it gave him a new home in Ragnarok, and now in Infinity War it's about pushing him as far as possible and seeing how strong Thor's grip is when holding on to his identity in the face of genuine true trauma. As defined by Freud, which I'm not an expert by any chance, I'm more of a sociologist, but he said, the patient cannot remember the whole of what is repressed in him, and what he cannot remember may be precisely the essential part of it. So more or less, think of trauma as a wound of the mind. But no matter what happens, Thor is able to heal and reassemble himself over and over again, to the point that he takes a full blast of a star in his ass. <laughs> Both the Guardians and Stormbreaker are used to highlight his strength and how truly resilient his identity really is. Peter Quill and Gang are explorers of new frontiers, but Thor is distinctly a settler because he's shaped by very specific geographical familial elements. Unlike Star-Lord and Gamora, he didn't run away from his parents because they were his home. He embraces his inheritance as opposed to reject them. Families can be tough. I feel your pain. And this confidence is what makes him immediately attractive and oddly compatible with the gang. This functional oddness is the defining emotional connective tissue for the whole Guardians of the Galaxy gang. And Stormbreaker is used as a symbolic marker of Thor's new logic and his new identity. He is a weapon, unbelievably powerful and chaotic, birthed from pain and endurance, focused with a very concentrated singular goal, but with very little thought on the long-term ramifications. I told you, <laughs> you'd die. Infinity War, despite its light-hearted attitude and very celebratory nature when portraying heroes standing on their last legs, is actually a very tragic movie about failure. Thor, despite all his strength and endurance, fails. And his final act in the film is the action that leads to his trauma. His little moment of indulgence at the end with torturing Thanos just for a second is what leads to the mass extinction of 50% of all life. His hubris, which previously fueled his resilience, is the source of his downfall. In academia, trauma is reserved purely for the inability to remember or make sense of experience. So previously, despite how life-shattering the events were, they wouldn't qualify as trauma because Thor could remember and still incorporate those memories into his inner narrative. But not this time. The blip meant different things to different people. For Steve and Tony, it was resentment and sorrow. For Natasha, it was the loss of her ideal identity, but for Thor, all he feels is guilt, his sense of continuity is genuinely gone now. Because trauma is when your sense of logic that your entire identity is built on is so deeply contradicted that new experiences can't be assimilated. You should have gone for the head. What did you do? I went for the head. In his mind, this was him fixing his mistake, but 
it only made everything worse. Thor completely loses his foundational narrative, and after the five years, his entire life is orientated more or less completely backwards, fixated on this one single action. And this is why his reintroduction with Hulk is so interesting. The abruptness of this shift forces the audience to notice how massive the character's decline is. And it also articulates how unstoryable his life has become, because his own explanations doesn't even convince himself. Similar to his reaction hearing the death of his own father from Thor 1, this is the character that is most emotionally naked. Deep down inside, the most fundamental foundational pillar that holds Thor together isn't the identity of a prince, a king, a brother, a superhero, a son, or even a warrior. Deep down inside, He's a little boy who was sheltered in a big kingdom, despite being 1500 years old. Can I come up? And that little kid inside him who listened to his father telling him a story is all that survived, because it's all that can survive. When he lost his hammer, like a little kid, he was happy to be with his friends. When he lost his mom, like a little kid, he had his girlfriend. When he lost his home, he still had his brother. And when he loses his brother, all he had was a youthful smile to energize himself. You never fought me twice. And I'm getting a new hammer. And now it's no longer enough, which is pretty dark, but kind of sickly relatable. So in Endgame, Thor somewhat goes full circle, back to his journey from Thor 1. His identity is wiped clean, and this little boy has to reconstruct himself. There's beer on the ship. I'm more kind. Because you can't ever restore yourself after a traumatic event. You have to completely create a new narrative, and similar to Steve, Tony, Nat, and Clint, time traveling offers an opportunity for this purpose. Just let me do it. Just let me do something good, something right. No. For Thor, going back to the day of his mother's death wasn't actually really about getting the reality stone. It was about encountering new mnemonic materials to reconstruct himself with. Frigga died, so simply having her recognize him despite the trauma actually gives Thor a pathway to connect his present self with the past. Yes, I am. The future hasn't been kind to you, has it? which finally provides a new continuity that is actually convincing to himself because he quite literally gets permission from the past to move on. You're here, aren't you? Seeking counsel from the wisest person in Asgard. Yeah, yes. Idiot now. A failure? Absolutely. It's a little bit harsh. Would you know what that makes you? Just like everyone else. I'm not supposed to be like everyone else, am I? Mm. Everyone fails at who they're supposed to be, Thor. The measure of a person, of a, a hero, is how well they succeed at being who they are. So there's actually some great thematic meaning to Thor holding on to both Manolo and Stormbreaker, because this is him literally becoming the master of two worlds. As Joseph Campbell described, the individual through prolonged psychological discipline gives up completely all attachment to his personal limitations, idiosyncrasies, hopes and fears. No longer resists self-annihilation that is prerequisite to rebirth in the realization of truth. Not only did I butcher that reading, but I'm pretty sure I've used this quote before. In the grand scheme of the story, this is Thor crossing the return threshold and coming home as a new man. And that's what's so interesting about the characters of Marvel Studios. You can have a massive seven film hero's journey made up of a bunch of smaller ones. So something as simple as seeing a character hugging his mother can be incredibly poignant because it's meaning that traveled from seven arcs prior. Anyways, Tony started as an individual motivated by self-interest, so his story ended with him dying to save everyone else. And where contrastly, Steve started aggressively altruistic and ended with him finally pursuing what he wants, Thor started as a boy seeking a nostalgic impression. And now he ends up letting it all go. He throws away the identity and status that he originally pursued and even inherited, and is now finally set free. He can finally venture into the unknown. Instead of being a settler, he becomes a traveler. Instead of becoming a king, he becomes an adventurer. Instead of becoming a leader of people, he humbly allows someone else to lead him. Instead of becoming an avenger, he becomes a guardian. He transforms from, uh, you get the idea. 
<laughs> Endgame looks at memory and concentrates on communication, not with others, but with the self. People often forget that language isn't just about interpersonal transaction, but also holds great value in simple forms of self-expressions. It doesn't matter that this scene with Frigga doesn't impact Thor Dark World. What matters is that Thor's mother is able to put into words how he felt, and in doing so, gives him a level of clarity that was previously blurred with muddiness. This is a form of personal power that doesn't involve a throne or a magical hammer or an axe, but a private sort of freedom. What we remember and how we remember often determines how we model our identities, because how we understand the present is dependent on how we understand the past, and vice versa. We are all narrative projects in our own little ways, and Thor as a character through seven films, despite all the collisions of varying creative imprints, is ultimately about this process. And more than any other Marvel Studios character, he can only exist because of this brand's strange convergence of serialized storytelling and traditional blockbuster filmmaking, where there's the freedom to clearly have radically different aesthetical desires, at the same time, all contributing to one singular character. So unlike his colleagues, Thor's journey was clearly never intended to have this arc. He's more like a garden as opposed to a piece of architecture. It benefits from being strangely chaotic. If you're here, I might even give you a hug. The fall and rise of one man's connection with the past is the emotional battlefield that Thor is shaped by. And because of that, more than any other MCU character, he's truly the most comic booky one of them all. Why does my accent have to keep changing every five seconds, Jesus? Just let me do it. Just let me do something good, something right. Can we expect you back? Um, about that. 